without us. <laughs> I, will, I can't attend. Okay, so we are recording. But and I'll be here, Christine. I'll be doing it. Hey. Yep. I mean, if we can, we certainly can, but we'll just have to play it by ear. Um, and thanks this, for all you're doing, Linda, on um, Facebook, too. Your rapid response. Thank you. Yep, that is good. Um, this is Nanette Kennedy, and this is the Evolution Revolution Humanities Team Weekly Book Discussion Group. We always discuss books by Neil Donald Walsh. We are currently on book three. And uh, I also want to say happy Awakening Day to everybody. So it's Awakening Day. And um, after this call, I'm going to go out and distribute little Valentines and put them on people's cars, their children's Valentines. And it says, love is the answer on the backside. And then I sign my name, not my full name, but my name. And then I put the website address. So with no further ado, let me see if I can. I thought I marked well where we were. Um, maybe I didn't. I marked it down, Annette. We finished with um, the paragraph, and so it is that the natural emotions, when repressed, produce unnatural reactions and responses, and the natural emotions are repressed in most people. Yet, do you know, do you know where that is, Linda? Uh, you know, I had it uh, marked, and then this this uh, PDF viewer, every once in a while, it just jumps. So let me get it back to It says you were given it. these tools at birth. They are to help you uh, negotiate life. And that's where we stopped. Yeah. 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 I'm just scrolling back here. I've got, yeah, I just annotate my... Uh, my PDF and I just drop a, a little text box in red that says start here with the date. Right. I'm there. We ready? Very good. Okay. Take so it why away. are these emotions repressed in most people? Well, they've been taught to repress them. They've been told to. By whom? Their parents, those who raised them. Why? Why would they do that? because they were taught by their parents and their parents were told by theirs. Yes, yes, but why? What's going on? What's going on is that you have the wrong people doing the parenting. What do you mean? Who are the wrong people? The mother and the father. The mother and the father are the wrong people to raise the children? When parents are young, yes. In most cases, yes. In fact, it's a miracle so many of them do as good a job as they do. No one is more ill-equipped to raise children than young parents. And no one knows this, by the way, better than young parents. Most parents come to the job of parenting with very little life experience. They're hardly finished being parented themselves. They're still looking for answers. They're still searching for clues. They haven't even discovered themselves yet. And they're trying to guide and nurture and discovery in others, even more valuable than they. They haven't even defined themselves, and they're thrust into the act of defining others. They're still trying to get over how badly they've been misdefined by their parents. They haven't even discovered yet who they are, and they're trying to tell you who you are. And the pressure is so great for them to get it right. Yet they can't even get their own lives right. So they get the whole thing wrong. Their lives, the lives of their children. If they're lucky, the damage to their children won't be too great. The offspring will overcome it, but probably, but not probably, before passing some on to their offspring. Most of you gain the wisdom, the patience, the understanding, and the love to be wonderful parents after your parenting years are over. Well, why is this? I don't understand this. I see that your observation is in many cases correct, but why is this? Because young child makers were never intended to be child raisers. Your child raising years when they are now over. Okay, I'm still a little lost here. 
human beings are biologically capable of creating children when they're children themselves, which it may surprise most of you to know they are for 40 or 50 years. Human beings are children themselves for 40 or 50 years? From a certain perspective, yes. I know that this is difficult to hold as your truth, but look around you. Perhaps the behaviors of your race might help prove my point. The difficulty is that in your society, you are said to be all grown up and ready for the world at 21. Add to this the fact that many of you were raised by mothers and fathers who were not much older than 21 themselves when they began raising you, and you can begin to see the problem. If childbearers were meant to be child raisers, childbearing would not have been made possible until you were 50. Childbearing was meant to be an activity of the young whose bodies are well developed and strong. Child raising was meant to be an activity of the elders whose minds are well developed and strong. In your society, you have insisted on making child bearers responsible for child raising, with the result that you've made not only the process of parenting very difficult, but you've distorted many of the energies surrounding the sexual act as well. Uh, can you explain? Yes. Many humans have observed what I've observed here, namely that a good many humans, perhaps most, are not truly capable of raising children when they are capable of having them. However, be, having discovered this, humans have put in place exactly the wrong solution. Rather than allow younger humans to enjoy sex, and if it produces children, have the elders raised them, you tell humans not to engage in sex until they're ready to take on the responsibility of raising children. You've made it wrong for them to have sexual experiences before that time and thus have created a taboo around what is intended to be one of life's most joyful celebrations. Of course, this is a taboo which offspring pay little attention to and for good reason. It's entirely unnatural to obey it. Human beings desire to couple and copulate as soon as they feel the inner signals which says that they're ready. This is human nature. Yet your thought about your own nature will have more to do with what you as parents have told them than about what they are feeling inside. Your children look to you to tell them what life is all about. So when they have their first urges to peek at each other, to play innocently with each other, to explore each other's differences, they will look to you for signals about this. Hang on. Uh, is this part of their human nature good? Is it bad? Is it approved of? Is it to be stilled, held back, discouraged, stifled? It is observed that many parents have told their offspring about this part of their human nature has, no, has had its origin in all manner of things, what they were told, what their religion says, what their society thinks, everything except the natural order of things. In the natural order of your species, Sexuality is budding out anywhere from age 9 to 14. From age 15 onward, it's very much present and expressing in most human beings. Thus begins a race against time, with children stampeding towards the fullest release of their own joyful sexual energy and parents stampeding to stop them. Parents have needed all the assistance and all the alliances that they could find in this struggle since, as has been noted, they are asking their offsprings to not do something that is, a, is every bit a part of their nature. So adults have intervened all manner of familial, cultural, religious, social, and economic pressures, restrictions, and limitations to justify their unnatural demands of their offspring. 
children have thus, have thus grown to accept their own sexuality is unnatural. How can anything that is natural be changed? Restrained by what? You're exaggerating? Really? What do you think is the impact on a four or five year old child when parents don't even use the correct name for certain parts of their body parts? What are you telling the child about their level of comfort with that? And what do you think there should be? Uh, yes, uh, indeed. Well, we, we just don't use those words, as my Grammy used to say. That's just wee-wee, and your bottom sounds better. Only because you have so much negative baggage attached to the actual names of these body parts that you can barely use the words in ordinary conversation. At the earliest of ages, of course, children don't know why parents feel this way, but merely are left with the impression, the often indelible impression, that certain body parts are not okay, and that anything having to do with them is embarrassing, if not wrong. As children grow older and move into their teens, they may be come to realize that this is not true. And then they are told in very clear terms about the connection between pregnancy and sexuality and about how they will have to raise children that they create. And so now they have another reason for feeling that sexual expression is wrong and the circle is complete. What this has caused in your society is confusion and not a little which is always the result of fooling around with nature. You've created sexual embarrassment, repression, and shame, which has led to sexual inhibition, dysfunction, and violence. You will, as a society, always be inhibited about that over which you are embarrassed, always be dysfunctional with behaviors which have been repressed, and always act out violently in protest of being made to feel shame about that over which you know in your heart you should never have felt shame at all. So then Freud was on to something when he said that a huge amount of the anger in the human spirit species might be sexually related, deep-seated rage over having to repress basic and natural physical instincts, interests, and urges. More than, more than one of your psychiatrists has ventured as such, as much. The human being is angry because it knows it should feel no shame over something that feels good. And yet, it feels shame and guilt. First, the human becomes angry with the self for feeling so good about something that is supposed to be so obviously bad. Then, when they realize they've been duped, that sexuality is supposed to be a wonderful, honorable, glorious part of the human experience, they become angry with others, parents for repressing them, religion for shaming them, members of the opposite sex for daring them, the whole society control for controlling them. Finally, they become angry with themselves for allowing all of this to inhibit them. Much of this repressed anger has been channeled into construction of distorted and misguided moral values in the society in which you now live. A society which glorifies and honors the mount monuments, statues, and commemorative stamps, films, pictures and TV programs, some of the world's ugliest acts of violence, but hides, or worse yet, cheapens, some of the world's most beautiful acts of love. And all of this, all of this, has emerged from a single thought, that those who bear children bear also the responsibility for raising them. But if the people who have children aren't responsible for raising them, then who is? The whole community. In most advanced races and societies, elders raise the offspring, nurture the offspring, train the offspring, and pass on to the offspring the wisdom, teachings, and traditions of their kind. 
Later, when we talk about some of these advanced civilizations, I'll touch on this again. In any society where producing offspring at a young age is not considered wrong because the tribal elders raise them, and there is therefore no sense of overwhelming responsibility and burden. Sexual repression is unheard of, and so is rape, deviance, and social sexual dysfunction. Are there such societies on our planet? Yes, although they have been disappearing. You have sought to eradicate them, assimilate them, because you have thought them to be barbarian in what you have called your non-barbarian societies. Children and wives and husbands, for that matter, are thought of as property, as personal possessions, and children bears must therefore become child raisers because they must take care of what they own. A root thought at the bottom of many of your society's problems is this idea that spouses and children are personal possessions that they are yours. We'll examine this whole subject of ownership later when we explore and discuss, discuss life among highly evolved beings. But for now, just think about this for a minute. Is anyone really emotionally ready to raise children at the time they're physically ready to have them? The truth is, most humans are not equipped to raise children even in their 30s and 40s and shouldn't be expected to be. They really haven't lived enough as adults to pass deep wisdom on to their children. Mm, I've heard that thought before. Mark Twain had a take on this. He was said to have commented, when I was 19, my father knew nothing. When I was 35, I was amazed at how much the old man had learned. He captured it perfectly. Your younger years were never meant to be for truth teaching or for truth gathering. How can you teach children a truth you haven't yet gathered? You can't. Of course, you'll wind up telling them the only truth you know, the truth of others. Your fathers, your mothers, your cultures, your religions, anything, everything but your own truth. You're still searching for that. And you will be searching and experimenting and finding and failing and forming and reforming your truth, your idea about yourself, until you're a half century on this planet or near it, near to it. Then you may begin at last to settle down, to settle in with your truth. And probably the biggest truth on which you'll agree is that there is no constant truth at all. That truth, like life itself, is a changing thing, a growing thing, an evolving thing. And that just when you think that process of evolution has stopped, it has not. And I've arrived at that. Good. You're now a wiser man, an elder. Now you should raise children. Or better yet, 10 years from now. It's the elders who should do the, raise the offspring and who are intended to. It's the elders who know of truth and life and of what is important and what is not of what is really meant by such terms as integrity, honesty, loyalty, friendship, and love. Hang on a sec. You're on mute, Linda. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I see the point you've been making here. It's difficult to accept, but many of us have barely moved from child to student when we have children of our own and feel we have to start teaching them. So we figure, well, I'll teach them what my parents taught me. Thus, the sins of the father are visited upon the son even unto the seventh generation. 
How do we change that? How do we end the cycle? Place the raising of children in the hands of your respected old ones. Parents see the children whenever they wish, live with them if they choose, but are not solely responsible for their care and upbringing. Physical and social and spiritual needs of the children are met by the entire community with education and values offered by the elders. Later in our dialogue, we talk about those other cultures in the universe. We'll look at some new models for living, but these models won't work the way you've currently structured your lives. What do you mean? I mean, it's not just parenting that you're doing with an ineffective model, but your whole way of living. Again, what do you mean? Well, you've moved away from each other. You've torn apart your families, disassembled your smaller communities in favor of large cities. In these big cities, there are more people but fewer tribes, groups or clans whose members see their responsibility as including responsibility for the whole. So in effect, you have no elders, none at an arm's reach anyway. Worse than moving away from your elders, you've pushed them aside, marginalized them, taken away their power, and even resented them. Yes, some members of your society are even resenting the seniors among you, claiming that they are somehow leeching on the system, demanding with increasing proportions of their income. That's true. Some societies, some sociologists are now predicting a generation war with older people being blamed for requiring more and more while contributing less and less. There are so many more other older citizens now, what with the baby boomers moving into their senior years and people, people living longer in general. Yes, yet if your elders aren't contributing, it is because you have not allowed them to contribute. You have required them to retire from their jobs just as they would really do the companies, just when they would really do the company some good, and to retire from most active, meaningful participation in life just when their participation could bring some sense to the proceedings. Not just in parenting, but in politics, economics, and even in religion, where elders at least had a toehold, you have become a youth worshiping, elder dismissing society. Yours has also become a singular society rather than a plural one. That is, a society made up of individuals rather than groups. As you have both individualized and youthened your society, you have lost most, much of its richness and resource. Now you are without both, with too many of you living in emotional and psychological poverty and depletion. I'm going to ask you again, is there any way we can end cycle? First, recognize and acknowledge that it's real. So many of you are living in denial. So many of you are pretending that what's so is simply not so. You're lying to yourselves and you do not want to hear the truth, much less tell it. This too, we'll talk about later. when We take a look at the civilizations of highly evolved being because this denial this failure to observe and acknowledge what's so is not an insignificant thing. And if you truly want to change things, I hope you will just allow yourself to hear me. The time has come for truth telling, plain and simple. Are you ready? I am. That's why I came to you. That's how this whole conversation began. Truth is often uncomfortable. It's the only, it is only comforting to those who do not wish to ignore it. Then truth becomes not only comforting, but inspiring. For me, this whole three-part dialogue has been inspiring. Please go on. There is some good reason to be upbeat, to feel optimistic. I observe that things have begun to change. There's more emphasis among your species on creating community and building extended families than ever in recent years. And more and more, you are honoring your elders, producing meaning and value in and from their lives. This is a big step in a wonderfully useful direction. So things are turning around. Your culture seems to have taken that step. 
Now it's onward from there. You cannot make these things change in one day. You cannot, for instance, change your whole way of parenting, which is how this current train of thought began, in one fell swoop. Yet you can change your future step by step. Reading this book is one of those steps. This dialogue will circle back over many important points before we are finished. That repetition will not be by accident. It is for emphasis. Now, you have asked for ideas for the construction of your tomorrows. Let us begin by looking at your yesterdays. End of chapter one. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I can think about 6,000 things to say here. Um, what are people's responses to the old elders raising the the youngers? I've always believed that. Me too. I had better relationships with my grandparents than I did with my mother. And they were much kinder to me and much less judgmental of me than my, uh, yeah, my mother was all about the wrongness of me. Well, I have my granddaughter here a lot. And she's eight years old. And my youngest son is 22. And he still lives at home. Which is one of the things, I don't know if Neil addresses this, but I think we have a tendency to tell our kids, you're 18, get out, go, you know, and I think, I think that's wrong because I think that's dividing up the family too. And I know in Europe, a lot of um, kids stay in the home until they're married or, you know, involved with a partner. But I know being the grandmother of an eight-year-old that you can probably hear in the background. There are some parts that are a little bit harder because if you spend a lot of time with a grandchild, you're, you are doing some of this parenting and you can't be the spoiling grandma all the time. And sometimes you have to draw lines and, say what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, like not telling the truth. Um, and so I find myself in the shoes of the parent where I, sometimes when I, my patience is being tested, which I do pretty well with, but when it has hit that line, I'll say, you know what? It's time for 10 minutes on the steps. Nanny needs a break, can't deal, you know. And then I feel bad because I've given the consequence. But if I gave her a consequence every time I thought of one, believe me, you, she'd be on the steps a lot more. Hi. How's everybody doing today? Good. Is this Ann? It's Ann, yeah. Hi, Hi Ann. Hi. It's interesting. This... Um, the later part of the chapter is what hit me and really got my mind thinking um, when the part, because see, I don't, I don't have children and uh, I didn't really know my grandparents. And I will add that my mom is now 95 years old or young and she is a kick because she is healthy, very healthy. And she, um, she's very filled, filled, full of life and everything and people what I see is she's so respected and so I mean we are not used to seeing people that are that old that are so with it or still able to function and have a personality and a sense of humor and the wisdom and I have a whole different experience of her today than the woman that raised me um, but anyway I think that she real what I see is that she always w wanted to be the center of attention and now she is because, and I think that's so great because I don't think we honor the elderly like we should, that they really have the knowledge and the information to give to us. So, but that isn't where the, the, the chapter took me. The chapter took me into my own head and into my own story and stuff of, of what he talked about when you're 50, that, that it is until you're 50 or you've lived a, 
a decade um, or half a century till you really are understanding life because you need to have all those experiences and you really don't know about what true friendship is and integrity and honesty and all that is. And it got me thinking because I've been going with, um, with someone who's 20 years younger than me. And, uh, and that came about too, because I was so sick and I missed 20 years of my life due to just being sick. So, so sick. And when I was freed of that and I was healed and, and I'm well, I actually look like I'm 10 years younger. And, and so my whole life is, is different because I, I almost feel like I'm getting an opportunity to live over again. And I don't get to share my story with most, but it seemed this chapter really seemed to hit home because what I find interesting about this relationship is we went for like a year and a half and then we broke up for a while while he found someone his own age and then we got back together again. And it just, for now, not for always, but it really works. And it's something about the stage of his life that he's in and the stage of my life that I'm in. And he's, anyway, um, I don't know what I was going to say about this, but it's like, gee, I wish that there was so much more that I guess that's where my path is in healing and stuff as I work with a lot of 20, 30 and 40 year olds, because we do have so much to, that we can see today that I see that I see today that I didn't have a clue about 20 years ago. And the, the last piece of this is, is when I was so sick uh, with, with liver disease and I had hepatic encephalopathy, which is the ammonia goes to your brain and you kind of get dementia you lose your memory. You, know, you really don't remember anything. And when I'm well now, my mind's come back. But the, the gist is when we come into this world, we come in without a map in the territory and we come in without a memory. And it's like, here I am again. And I missed a lot of years, but I have all my memories and I have all my experiences. And somehow it's pretty awesome to be in this place. And I, don't really have very many people that I can talk that I talk to about it or anything but I thought it was good since this is a book club and a uh, um, room for discussion I thought it was an interesting piece to throw out with this chapter about <laughs> sexuality and <laughs> yep. and, and uh, let the group kind of dabble with that or something so and I'm glad to be able to share this with someone too because it's been a hell of a walking for the last 10 years well, we're glad yeah. you're here with us. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'll, I'll come back later on, but take it away. <laughs> okay, well, I was just going to say, um, I think where he mentions uh, the Mark Twain quote, and I can't remember, I think it's Neil that Something mentions about his it. his father being, yeah, 35, he, you know, but now that he's 35, He's amazed at how much his father's grown or something like well, that. Well, I, I used to think that about my own parents. And, you know, I thought, what do they know? And then, you know, when I got to be a little bit older, I got it. And then when my oldest son graduated from high school, he was going through a major I know everything phase. And I'm about to be on the, you know, I'm on the cusp of knowing everything on the planet. And for he got a car for his graduation but he also got a blank journal for me and then in the inside cover of it i said trust me when i tell you write all the stuff you know down because in a few years you're going to forget that you knew everything and you can refer back to this <laughs> um and i don't think he found a lot of humor in it. i did but um it is amazing that you know, you get to be in your late 20s, early 30s, and all of a sudden you realize your parents aren't the ding-dongs that you thought they were over. Sorry about the noise. It's okay. It's everybody's on mute. It's so funny. Or their pictures aren't up and they're on mute. Um, the other thing I thought we could all talk about is, um, you know, what we're told about sexuality when we're, 
younger. And I, for one, didn't know anything about it until a girlfriend told me. And then I tried to break off our friendship because I told her my parents would never do anything like that. Period. <laughs> um, but, you know, we are told these... Well, and my mother finally told me I needed to sit down because she needed to talk to me because I was defending my friend and my mother, or defending my mother to my mother. And that's when she said, no, you better sit down because I got something to tell you. And I was horrified. I just, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Um, and I think you've heard me say on different calls that my grandmother's mother on my grandmother's wedding day told my grandmother to lay back and think of the queen of England. <laughs> yeah, I was like, and you know, so there's nothing messed up about that. Um, but uh, anyway, if anybody else wants to make a comment. Well, there's just so much about, um, <clears throat> our sexualness that's been, I mean, weren't you supposed to have blood on your sheets on your wedding night? Otherwise, it, you know, like it's, there's been a lot that's, and it comes very early about the wrongness of, of sexuality. Yep. And it's given to us from all sides. Um, you know, not only our parents, but our learning institutions, our religious institutions it um yeah it just starts very very young and um yeah i haven't even thought of it go ahead linda i was just gonna say i it, you know imagine what the world would be like if instead of uh you know making it this big taboo if instead we allowed the natural expression of it and instead just taught how to prevent pregnancy and had a society that when there were babies born they were accepted into the community and into society and i mean it would be a whole different world um, and that's where I think, you know, understanding, you know, we, we know that we're related to chimpanzees, but understanding that the, the, the fork in the road that occurs with the chimpanzee species and that, you know, there's two very distinct versions of chimpanzees and the bonobos uh, use sex in this way that Neil and God are talking about. They use it for comfort. They use it, five-year-olds will, will have what we would label as sexual encounters, but they're not. They're using it as a, a comforting tool. They're using it as a way to help each other feel better and to process. And I think that, you know, we could learn so much from what those animals do versus the others, which are warring, fighting. You know, not a, there, there's no history that we know of of a bonobo chimp killing another bonobo chimp but regular chimps kill each other all the time just like humans i did not know that that's very interesting no i i've seen um <clears throat> there was a, a fine example of um unrepressed sexuality and you know when babies are born babies know how to please themselves sexually and um yes they you know do. and you know, and then they're programmed into the wrongness of that. And, you know, and so they believe the innocence that knows how to sexually please itself um, believes a lot of lies. And then we grow up believing these lies. I agree. And I'm, I'm guilty of, and my daughter will never listen to this tape. So but we'll just not mention names. Um, I used to tell her that she needed to go to her room when she was doing that. Not like punishment. Not like go to your room. Just 
go to your room, honey. Um, and when my youngest son came dashing through the door one day to tell me he'd had his first sexual encounter, he was 14. I was like, blah, 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 I can't know this. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, God, you can, I've always told him he could tell me anything. Well, by God, he didn't leave out a detail. Um, but it, it just catches you off guard. So there's, there's that, you know, it's like, Meow. not sure what to do with this. Over. No, but it's like, um, you know, Neil says in this chapter, it's like history has a way of repeating itself without an act of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. The feedback loop just, you know, continues on. And I really like the idea of, um, you know, where children are raised by a whole community. Um, yeah, I really like that idea a lot. And I think um, the confidence level of humanity will increase dramatically when we um, adopt such a model. Um, I, have a com I have a comment here which goes into the difference between uh, the male and the female though. Imagine if your 14 year old daughter came home and had her first sexual experience and wanted to, and you said, you can tell me everything and wanted to talk to you about it. Um, there's a, there's a huge difference between, uh, females and males as far as also what we're taught about, about sexuality and sex. I know that my friend, I don't know if he was, if it's Greek or whatever, but he said a rite of passage in his family was when they were 13, they were taken to um, um, a, a cat house, a whorehouse or something to get laid, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, to me, that, that's, I can't imagine because of the way that I was raised, you know, and, and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, you wait until you're married and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so there's the issue there between when we're talking about sexuality, what do you do about, you know, we're talking about the whole, but what about the difference between the way that male and females are taught about it? I agree with what you're saying. It is an, it is an equal, let's put it that way. Yeah, well, for, for me, I would have been the same way if my daughter had run in the house, I would have gone, I can't hear, because for me, and this is my own deal, until I had children, one of the most disgusting visions I could put in my brain was my parents having sex. It was like, bah! you know, it was fine for me to have it when I got older, and it, but it's still, I just, I didn't want to picture that. Then when I had kids and they got old enough to be having sex themselves, I was like, no, I don't want to envision that. It's, in, you know, it's, it's their thing. Um, it's their thing. And it is like Christine was saying, it's kind of a knee jerk. You know, it, because they, all these things I'm speaking of were knee jerk situations where I was like, didn't even take the time to take a deep breath. And, you know, so it's part of my own programming over. Well, and it's true. I mean, think of, think of the power that rests within our breath. But, you know, I was an adult before I ever learned about the power in my breath. It wasn't something that I was taught in my own home or in my school system like it yeah we're it's a lot of a lot of programming that um doesn't benefit our development and uh now i breathe consciously every, every day but you know i was a shallow breather probably until my mid 20s i'm done thank you I want to live in a society where they have not just cat houses, but what do we call them? Dog houses where, <laughs> where women could go and there would be men who would, you know, take care of us sexually. <laughs> yeah. You could be honest. I, I think they that. have a TV show called Cougars. Yeah. Never seen it, but no, I, don't I don't know, know if it's still going, but. Anyway, it, it is interesting, the distortions that um, humanity has taken on with regards to our sexuality. 
it is believe me and you know and that's not even to cover the fact um of women or men and i'm going to say boys or girls their first sexual experience is something violent or um ancestral and that can play some real havoc oh there's i mean we've got still uh, cultures where you know 60 year old 70 year old men are allowed to marry five-year-old girls like that's it's really really quite distorted sarah are your kitties okay yes thank you the kitchen's a bit of a mess for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well cats will do that um anyway i think we have a lot you know to do in fact it's, it's probably going to spawn conversations with me to my children saying you know when i reacted this way that probably was not the greatest reaction i hope you don't need to be in counseling <laughs> um but there's you know no handbook and believe me if my grandmother was going to tell me about sex she probably would have told me to lay back and think of the queen you know so she probably wouldn't have been the right person to be schooling me on that department. And who was it? So the 13 year old, Oh, it was Anne. when in my family and there were five daughters, two sons, um, when we women had our first period, it was a celebration. You know, um, you're, you know, coming into womanhood and um, it was, I mean, really nice dinner. It was like a birthday, you know, you didn't, we didn't get any gifts, but, um, well, the gift was being with your family and not being able to be, not be embarrassed about what has come to pass. I'm remembering um, Hillary's book. It takes a village. Mm -hmm. I, I never read it, but I think that, you know, the, the gist of it is, is it takes a village to raise children. And, and That's we, exactly what Neil says as well, and it's true. Yeah. When I was uh, young, I grew up in the beaches area of Toronto on Lake Ontario, and <clears throat> We had community policing then, and then it, I don't know what happened in the 70s, but the police that um, took care of our neighborhood, they knew every teenager. They would invite us to come and sit in their cars. They knew us, right? They knew us and they took the time to know us and it wasn't just about the wrongness of you. You know, really, it, w it was more um, leadership than I had in my own home. It was... Um, it was a beautiful thing and then it kind of went away for 40 years and I think it's coming back now. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I think there's gonna be an uptick in things like neighborhood watches and, you know, yeah. just people coming back together. Well, you know, like I know here in Victoria and in London, Ontario, probably from the late 70s, um, community gardens became very popular. And um, at the University of Victoria, they have a huge community garden for the students because a lot of students don't have a lot of money, but at least you can grow nutritious food. And it doesn't cost them anything to have a plot. Right. Right. So we are getting better. And, and that's, you know, growing our own food, that is a part of this conversation, really. But, but that's something that we all need to be doing is, you know, everybody with a balcony needs to have a flower box and be growing, even if all they're growing is herbs or a head of lettuce, you know, it's. We had kale for our whole street this year. Um, yeah. 
But um, yeah, when I was moving from London, Ontario to um, Victoria uh, in 2005, two movers that came to move me said, well, you can't take your plants. And I said, well, then you can't move me because some of my plants I've had since I was a girl, right? And so they're, you know, and everybody, I divvied everybody up into twos and threes in case somebody didn't make it because they were going to be in the dark. But I talked to them and everybody made it. Everybody made it. So, yeah. Well, I know as a grandparent, uh, so I never birthed my own children. I only have stepchildren. Um, but, but I know as a grandparent that I feel much more capable of caring for children than I felt when I had stepchildren, when I had small stepchildren in my 20s and 30s, you know. Um, and and I think I think there's a, a really good point that gets made in this chapter about community and elders. And, and you know, I don't know if you've seen there's some stuff that you can find about where they've put like nursery schools and kindergartens into elder care homes. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It gives the older people something to do. And what blessings for those little ones. Exactly. And they have, I think it's in um, the Netherlands, they have where um, residences where um, students, like, you know, university students get to live for free in these seniors' homes. And the bonds and the relationships that are formed are just beautiful. It's yeah. very, very beautiful. I saw that on your, I think I saw that on your page, Christine. That was a really interesting little clip there. It was really yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, it, it, you know, like we're moving in the right direction. Um, we are. And uh, yeah, we are. We absolutely are. Even look like at the moment. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it, it is a miracle that in the last 25 years that we can communicate with each other like this in this forum and, you know, see what's going on. That in and of itself is a miracle. Mm -hmm. We are moving in the right direction. I feel like my family history is like probably like part of the reason why Neil had to write this chapter. Yeah, um, no, mine too, Brenna. Yeah, because there was a lot of things that like, you know, just shouldn't be done but we're done anyways a lot of boundaries crossed a lot of trauma a lot of abuse and it's taken a couple of generations to kind of purify and I, by no means am I like purified or what but it's just taken a couple of years to just sort of <clears throat> process that trauma it's taken a lot of like a few, even a few generations to sort of move past some of the things that happened and I would definitely say that though I'm not perfect I've definitely come to a place where things are better for, for me and observably better for some of the other family members that are still alive that were um, part of the abuse and trauma. So it, it does, life has a way of, time has a way of cleansing things, I guess you could say, in a very natural sort of way. Yeah, you know, I've been for the last, I don't know how long, but for quite a while, um, just, memories are coming up to be released and it's like I had a postdoc in stuffing feelings I'll tell you like the things that I'm remembering to be released are like really like you know and you know to be kind and gentle to myself that you know I even survived that childhood right yeah yeah oh and you're so sweet and so loving and I just think that's yeah that, that's really hard to carry those for... Hi. Sorry. You know, Sorry. There's, there's an aspect of this that goes even beyond what we're talking about, because we're talking about, you know, the morphogenic field, the hundredth monkey, the greater consciousness, all the people that have gone before us. And like when we talk about wisdom of the elderly, but the elderly is more, it's like generations. 
it's like we're walking on the paths of all those people that have that have walked before us, and we are now reaping the benefits in a on a on a conscious level of all of this that's been learned, all of this that's been healed, all of this that needs to be healed. Um, it, it's so much so much bigger than just than just this generation or, or us. It's enormous. Yes, it is. It. And, you know, it needs to be remembered and then forgiven and held. I'm also a student of uh, Richard Rudd's The Gene Keys. And, um, you know, there's just so much that's coming out now, like Neil's books and, uh, you know, The Gene Keys. All of it is, like, we're ready to make this shift now. And... Um, to be, you know, kinder and more loving to ourselves. And loving ourselves means that I love you too, because there is no separation, right? Yes. And um, I'm just going to tell the story quick, quickly as possible. Um, how many of you have heard of Immaculate Ilbagisa? She was a genocide survivor and I a few five years ago maybe uh, I met her in person at a celebrate your life conference in Phoenix and uh, Wayne Dyer brought her to be part of the keynote speech and he tells part of this story and you don't get too far into the story where everybody's got a Kleenex um, because she lost two of her three brothers, her father, and I believe her mother to the, I can't remember the, the different tribes' names, but... Tootsies and the Hutus. Right, but I can't remember which one she was a member of. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, she was locked into a neighbor's home the neighbor who was on the opposing side um, let her stay with nine other women in a three by five bathroom oh yeah uh, i read that book yeah it's very powerful and anyway so they stay there for 90 days they get out i mean she's heard the machetes outside the bathroom window she heard one of her brothers being killed and um, so at this conference, um, I was having her, I just went up to hug her and I about fainted because she had on this rosary around her neck that was identical to a rosary that I didn't know how it got, how it got into my computer bag at the, you know, from my house to the airport. And it kept setting off bells and whistles and then we couldn't figure that out. Anyway. We were at the, uh, she said, you know, we should have a, a group. Of, if anybody wants to learn how to say the rosary, we'll meet at 7 in the morning. So we did, and there was about 25 people out of this enormous crowd that came, and she talked about the different prayers of the rosary and what they meant to her. And, um, and she told, as she had the night before, she told the story about, how she kept saying forgive them father for they know not what they do and she went to the prison where these people killed her family and she forgave them and it was so powerful because then everybody most everybody got up to leave to go to these different classes that they hold lectures and immaculate started talking more about her story that she hadn't told the night before and there were only nine of us there and she said and it was nine women she goes we are all we are the nine women that were in that bathroom for 90 days right here sitting on these couches and i started sobbing there was no kleenex there was no nothing and i went outside and cried myself silly after we parted ways into a a beach towel I was just you know but it was really very compelling and beautiful to hear someone who's been to 
and we've all been to hell and back in our own ways. But um, to it, it changed my whole life and the way of me being far more forgiving. I am, I am forgiving. I don't hold it. You know, I, don't, I just don't. So somebody said something that made me think of that. So I thought I'd tell you that. But now we've run a couple of minutes over unless anybody else wants to add something. Well, Nanette, I am so grateful that you sobbed and cleansed in that way. I am so grateful. And thank you. You're welcome. It was needed, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just one of those moments where I, I had a dress on and the whole front of my dress was wet. Because before I got to the beach towel, I was just dripping tears. But... Um, well, on Friday, I had to take Benjamin to the vet because he got in a cat fight, Sarah, and um, <laughs> he had, you know, this fast-growing tumor on his head, and um, so he's, now he's in an Elizabethan collar, but there was, um, well, we were waiting to see the vet. There was this couple that came in um, with a cat, and then, um, you know, I was in buying some cat food, and then she came in with the empty cage, and she just looked and at me, and she said, we had to put um our friend down this is we had to say goodbye and we just wrapped our arms around each other and started crying right like it was and i'd never seen her before but you know it was just a moment right and and the the vet tech you know she just like thank you like you know like we are just one and the same really when we that is something we have in common when we open our hearts yes absolutely so. You know, and it's a journey for all of us. And if we could just remember that while we're doing our daily life things. And be like, kind and gentle to yourself. And, and to ourselves as well. But I mean, I used to get grocery cart rage in the grocery store. You know, I'd be like, get, get here my way. I wouldn't hurt anybody. But I'd be, my head would just be going nuts, like, move it, move it, move it, you know. And I so let that go. I just whatever, you know. In the grocery store? <laughs> yeah. I Well, people would be standing there talking to somebody that they know and I want to get through and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, um, next week, um, Linda, thank you, is going to be uh, running this call unless Christine and I can, which is not impossible, that we can be on one of the Sunday calls because one of the Sundays is a freebie day, but I don't know which one. The, the one Sunday, um, the 26th, I have to leave the hotel again, like at four in the morning. To get okay, you won't be joining us for that call. <laughs> no, but if we're able to join next Sunday, it, it's uh, two hours ahead of, so it would be like one o'clock in the afternoon that I'd be able to join you in Costa Rica time. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, everybody, I love you. Love you. And Thanks, everyone. I love this group. And Kristen, it's good to see you here. Yeah, Kristen. Happy awakening day. I yeah. saw you your Valentine's on Facebook. Yep. All right, okay. everybody. Love you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you so you. much.